Okay, so we're going to talk about this uh, new topic called structure for motion, and this uh, falls under a bigger topic called shape form X. So um, the idea is to recover the 3D shape um, from one or two images, and this is a very big topic in computer vision. As we've been talking about, the images are 2D. The world is 3D. You get the images, which is projection of two, 3D on 2D, and you want to recover 3D information. And there are many methods to do that. Stereo is one, which we're going to talk about tomorrow. And motion, which we are going to talk about today. And then shading and photometric stereo, texture, contours, silhouettes, and lots, lots of different ways to recover 3D from 2D images. And that's for the humans, too, because our, our vision system is also come, you know, projecting 3D to 2D. So retina is like an image plane, and we are getting 2D, but we are able to recover this 3D, and we are able to navigate uh, in the 3D world, and, and that's important. Um, so um, the um, uh, applications are many. If you can do the 3D recovery, then you can do object recognition. You can recognize objects in 3D. You can do robotics. You can put a camera on the robot. Can robot can move around, navigate, follow a path, and uh, you can do computer graphics. You know, you can have realistic uh, videos or imagery because you can, you know, generate uh, uh, new viewpoints. Uh, you can do image retrieval. You can do geolocalization. You can find out what is the exact location the picture was taken. Uh, it is used in archaeology that, you know, you can un try to understand in the old days when these particular cities which were ruined, destroyed, you know, what used to be the culture, what used to be structure, the streets, and so on. So there are lots of lots of application of that. And of course, the sports, you can use uh, 3D in the sports. So um, one good application is this Connect, Microsoft Connect. You know, many of you use, use Xbox, and the Connect helps you to uh, get this 3D because it has this 3D sensor, which is not a vision base, it's some different sensor, but um, that's what um, it's able to do that, you know. So these are the examples that these are the gestures, um, which on the on this row we are showing you these are the depth images, which is the 3D images, which shows you the intensity show how far are you from the camera, okay? So this area is further than the person and this is closer than this guy, and so on. And these are the simple RGB images, which are the color images. So Connect will give you both of those. And there's a lot of research going on to how to use these kind of um, uh, videos. And this is called RGBD, RGB and depth, the 4D data you are getting uh, when you include time, because you have video. At time, at, at every time instance, you have RGBD. Okay, so um, so these are some of the examples of different gestures. There's a very interesting data set uh, where you can, um, the challenge is to recognize these different kind of gestures. And these are gestures normally you use to, uh, when you do the video games with the Xbox, so instead of using the controller, you, know, you want to use the gestures to, to do this very realistic um, kind of, um, experience okay so um, and these are you know some more of examples of these different kind of gesture these are the depth uh, these are the RGB images but there are corresponding depth images to be analyzed and what um, the um, the uh, the connect is providing that in addition to the RGB it's providing you depth images also and um, so that's one. So as I have shown you this thing, that uh, humans have different cues to recover 3D, and stereo is one, the motion is another one, shading is third one, and there are lots of them. And what we perceive is integration of all those cues. Now, um, if we mask out all other cues, then just motion is still pretty powerful cue to recover 3D. And so this is an example of that, which is called moving light display. So, so imagine that you look at these uh, dots here in a single image. Uh, you don't; it can be anything. But when you start uh, playing this, 
and you can start to see there's a person which is walking. So which is very powerful cue that what we are doing is perceiving this structure in 3D, uh, recovering this and just based on very minimum information and all other things are actually masked out, which is, which is very good. And uh, so uh, this is one thing and um, what we are going to talk about today that how can we write a computer program which will take images like this and recover the 3D shape and also 3D motion and so that you can then synthesize images from different viewpoints which are shown here. And this is a very um, simple method and it really works very well. So um, the problem is that we are um, given uh, optical flow or the point correspondences, we want to compute 3D motion which is the translation and the rotation and then shape information. So that's called structure for motion problem. Okay. So um, there are, this problem has been very popular for the last 20 years or even more and there are many, many authors have try to address this problem because in generality it's a very difficult problem even though now they have a nicer solution. So it started in a way from Shimon Ullman at MIT then there are a whole series of people, almost every senior person um, fam from famous group have worked on this problem and there's a whole list of these and some of you you have heard about um, like Kanade and you know the Semin and so on. So there's a whole list of these and even we have done this. One of my former PhD students, she worked on this structure of motion about 10, 15 years ago. So it's a very rich uh, area and uh, but uh, recently uh, this has made a lot of progress and as I showed you before and I'll show you this again uh, that um, this um, um, method from the from the Microsoft, I think uh, what is called Photosynth has really um, had a big impact and uh, this is a nice video which uh, kind of um, explain to you what uh, this method is. <coughs> about what Photosynth does as linking images together. Whenever images are taken in a common environment, it's as if you form a hyperlink between them. And, and so now if you think about the emergent network of hyperlinks between images that, that, can, that can be built by a crawler, say, uh, going out and searching the whole, uh, the whole web, it's a very powerful idea. Here's a shot of St. Peter's Basilica. We're looking at it where we can navigate through hundreds of photos. One thing happens when we arrange all these guys into a common three-dimensional environment. Here's a point cloud, the model that's going to be constructed from all those images. Let's turn all the images on so we can see where they all ended up. This is a kind of complicated picture of lots of photos in their own planes inside that model. Let's go dive in and find the photo we're looking at. And now we can move back and forth among different photos like this, just moving from side to side. These white boxes that are now appearing on the screen are showing where photos were taken. So, for example, if you want to close up over here, you click on that, and you see that everything is registered perfectly for the national order. So, you can imagine uh, a technology like this one, with many people's photos being registered simultaneously, becoming like a three dimensional map or a universe. We have a three dimensional reconstruction of the environment. And we can also, of course, look at those photos individually, and then from there we can navigate around the space either via photos or via the entire environment. This is all of them turned off simultaneously, which is kind of fun. If we want to look at other images similar to what we're looking at right now, we can do this trick. Now we move close to the center of the screen all the images that share a lot of context with that image that we were just looking at before. These are nearly identical shots. Here's, for example, a close-up of this clock Looking at similar shots, we see that the clock also occurred in a number of other photos, like this one. So this gives you a way of grouping and navigating between images using the image contents without any kind of tagging having taken place beforehand, no hand intervention. This shows you how you can zoom on different parts of the image. And uh, as we zoom, only the necessary data for that particular part is, is coming in. This is all the images that have this same content anywhere in them. So 
there's another image of the same museum. Another image. And you can see the registration happened in real time. So we go back and forth between those images. Here we're moving back and forth among neighboring images, so they're just to share some content. So this gives you a kind of neighborhood score. Gives you a rapid way of navigating around in side by space. If you had an image like this one, somewhere on the web, and you wanted to know what's in one of those murals, another photo would just be discoverable like that. This photo couldn't come from somewhere else entirely. It certainly gives you a way of looking at other perspectives on something, or close-ups, or what's around the corner, based on a starting image. Let's say that this close-up is on a web page that talks about this particular scene. You can dive in and dive back. Okay, so, so you got an idea that, you know, even though this... Um, is doing you know many different things and so on, but basic um, fundamental problem we are going to talk about, given two images, um, how we want to recover the 3D information. Okay, so so we are going to talk about this particular algorithm by Tamasi and Kanade. In Kanade, same the KLT um, tracker which we are implementing, and in that case, Kanade. Um, L is Lucas and T is Tomasi actually so he also contributed, Tomasi also contributed to that tracker. So um, so the assumptions are that the camera model is orthographic so this is um, a much um, um, simpler uh, model as compared to perspective but it's still uh, they will show that they can recover 3D you know as you know the in general model is a perspective as compared to orthographic. Uh, but our perspective is nonlinear because the depth appears and the denominators create a problem. So we are going to um, assume that we have P points, you know, and we have the F frames, uppercase F frames, and F has to be at least we have more than, you know, three frames, three or more frames. And these points for which we want to recover 3D, um, they are not in the same plane. You know, if they are same plane, then we have a problem. And, of course, these points in the images, they have been tracked. So you have used your KLD tracker to get these shift points or, or the Harris points. You get the tracks, and we are going to use, actually, those to do this. Um, so then this is a batch mode that we have all the points of um, uh, in the, all the frames. So we have tracks of these images, and we are going to use all of those to recover the 3D and also the motion from every consecutive frame. Okay, so um, and uh, we don't require the camera calibration if we accept that this 3D structure will have up to scale factor. That you know, if you have same object but it is scale, and you take a video of that, we will get the same uh, same structure. We won't be able to say, well, this is a smaller one, this is a bigger one. So that's one one problem because of orthographic projection and camera calibration not done, which is fine. So, so input is uh, frames like this. They are showing the four frames, and you are showing the in the KLT tracks, which you will get, you know, which you are getting in your program. So, what we are going to do is KLT tracks will give you an image point, the location of these points uh, in different frames. Okay, and we are going to rec represent them by U and V. These are the x and y coordinates. They are not optical flow. They're just notation. They have used this one, so we'll stay with that. So you just want to be aware of that. So here we have the, these are the frame numbers, small f from 1 to f, and then p is points. So we have the um, x coordinate, which is represented by u, of the point p in frame f, and y coordinate of point P in frame F. So that's a general notation which we're going to use. So what we are going to do is we'll take these tracks, we'll put them in this matrix, which is W, and uh, <clears throat> this first row will be the X location of these points in the, in the first frame. So this is a first index is the frame number, and second index is the point. So this is the first frame. Um, all of them, so the first point, second point, third point, and P point. This is the uh, first row. And here the first row is the Y coordinates. And similarly, we'll have a second row, which will be the second frame, third frame, fourth frame, and this is the last frame, F frame. These are the X coordinates, and these are the Y coordinates. So we are going to organize these points like that, simple as a matrix, okay? 
so uh, what you can do, you know, take output from your KLD tracker, which you can generate this matrix, okay? And we will represent this matrix uh, in the short form that we have upper pass of part of this matrix is U, uh, which has the F rows and P columns, and lower part of the matrix is another uh, F rows and P column, okay? So that's called W matrix. So first thing we are going to do is normalize these um, coordinates, uh, image coordinates of these points, um, finding the average, the mean, in every frame. So we'll take the say, x coordinate of all the points P and add them up, divide by P. So it'll be average um, of the x coordinate in frame F. We're going to do this for all the frames. And similarly, we are going to do this for the y coordinates. So then we are going to subtract the mean from each of these coordinate of these points, you know, which we'll call delta u and delta v. So this is the point P in frame F, and this is the um, x coordinate, this is the y coordinate. Very simple. Okay? So, we, you know, we remember this is the equation A. So, so the geometry is very, very easy and very intuitive. So the idea is that we have, say, point P in a 3D. Well, suppose there's a point P that camera is, you know, that's a point. Then we have a 3D coordinate system, you know, X, Y, Z. You know, suppose, you know, my origin is there. This is, uh, you know, X, this is Y, and then this is Z, for example. So I can find out the <clears throat> 3D coordinates of that point P um, with respect to this word coordinates. Then I'm taking a video, I'm taking pictures. These are the pictures, and they are at time, different time. Time t, time t plus 1, t plus 2. These are the pictures. And then the, I have a coordinate system attached to each of the image, or the coordinate, each of the image or camera. So these are the coordinate system of my images, and I have uh, <coughs> the coordinate um, system is i, j, and k. These are the unit coordinates. And uh, I will have like this for every frame. So that's why these have indexes F. So now this coordinate system has an origin here, and there's a translation from this coordinate system to word coordinate system, which is translation for the frame F. It will be translation for frame F plus 1, F plus 2, and so on. So that's the geometry, and it's very simple idea uh, to capture this and we are going to use that. Okay, So now um, we have a 3D point and this rep coordinate represent x coordinate, y coordinate, z coordinate. You know, that's, you know, three numbers. Then we have these unit coordinate systems which are tied to the frames. Each image we take from the camera and they are unit vectors and as you know that if I take um, any of two unit coordinates, find a dot uh, cross product, then I'll get a third one. That's the idea of the uh, x, y, z. You know, if you take, uh, you know, one zero one and zero one zero, find a cross product of that, you will get a z. You know, that's what you have learned. The vectors. So therefore, i is the unit coordinate for x axis. This is for y axis. This is for z axis. This is a fact. And that's why you want to have this coordinate system. So now, under the orthographic projection, because as you know, there's no focal length, there's no z. It's a very simple idea. So the orthographic projection is that you take a point in 3D, which is this one, and you want to represent them in terms of the image coordinates, which is u and v. And what you do, you since the word coordinate and the uh, camera coordinate is translated by translation. This is original translated, so you want to get, take care of that. By taking the 3D points, which were with respect to word coordinate, you subtract the translation. Now you have these coordinates in the image coordinates, or the camera coordinate. Then you want to find out the projection of this in x-axis, which is i. And then you get the x-coordinate, you find the projection y, X is you get the y coordinate with this that i cross product j has to be uh, k, which is a z axis. Okay, so that's very simple 
model of orthographic projection. As you know, the x, y, z project to x, y, and y, x, small x and small y. And these are the image coordinate, x, y, z, uppercase, they are the word coordinates. Okay? And um, so the only difference is the, the translation with respect to word or with respect to the image uh, coordinates. So that's what we have taken care of by subtracting translation from here. Okay? So now <clears throat> what we are going to do is uh, look at this again. So we are, these are the normalized, mean normalized coordinates of the point P in frame F. This is the X coordinate and these are the original one. We subtracted mean from it and, and uh, we are going to use here the, um, the what we just expressed that we can express the X image coordinate by taking the 3D points, subtracting from the translation of the word origin to the camera, and then projecting on the X axis. This is what we just explained to you using this figure. Then we also know that the mean um, that AF is given by this, which is the summation of the X coordinate of the, all the points in particular frame and dividing by the number of points, which we just explained. So then in this one, we are going to use this also that how we can express the uh, U in terms of the word coordinates and translation. So now this will, from here, this will become like that. So we have, by definition, U is given by this and then IF, which we just use here. But here we have more points. We have actually P points, so we use that. And um, just to not confuse, we just use a different index Q to sum them up and so on. But this is exactly the same as here. Just we have used a definition of U, which we use here as we explain how we got that. So now we have two terms, okay? So um, one is that we have <coughs> the, um, <coughs> we have this IFT, uh, multiply by TF and we have IFSP from here and from here we have IFSQ and um, then IF multiplied by TF. Now if you look at the um, uh, this last term this you are finding dot product of I with TF and this is the P times uppercase P time and then we are dividing by P. So we um, will get actually IFTF, you know, because they are, they are uh, P number, number of times we are summing this up, and then we divide it by P, which means the summation will give you P multiplied by IFTF, divided by P will become same IFTF, which is here. So this will simplify that <coughs> we will um, get rid of from here this will disappear and this will disappear. So from this one we'll get SP and then uh, IF is outside and from here we'll get SQ, IF and 1 upon P. That's so a simplification of this. Okay? So now one thing we are going to assume here that we can select the word coordinate which is at the mean of the the mean of the 3D points which we have. So, which means that if we, um, if the origin of the word coordinate is such that it is located at the centroid or mean of the um, word points, then this actually will become zero because that's the origin. If you sum them up, you know, mean is zero, you know, zero that's why we pick the origin here. So therefore, this term actually can disappear depending on how we select the the origin of the word coordinates, which is which is pretty easy. You get the all the word points. You just uh, find the mean of them. You subtract from each of those, so it become zero basically here. So then all this simplifies to a very simple expression, saying the mean normalized image x coordinates are given by uh, by this. Take the three D points and these projected on the uh, unit vector in the x direction and we'll have same thing for the y coordinate. There we'll have j instead of i here. Okay? So that's what we have. These are the x coordinates, the y coordinate, 
and which are obtained from the 3D uh, points and using these the uh, unit coordinate for that particular frame and that's what the geometry we describe. So we can write down this uh, in terms of again this W delta matrix as we did for W and there we were putting unnormalized coordinates U and V. Now here we are putting the normalized coordinate U tilde and W tilde which is fine which we can do that. Okay, so now, um, and, and this W tilde will be that, you know, we'll have this U, uh, and this is uh, first frame, second frame, third frame, the last frame, first pine, second pine, and so on. These are the X coordinate, these are Y coordinate. Same thing as we did before for W, but here now we are normalized, which is delta. We are subtracting them mean from, from those coordinates, okay? So, um, so, you know, that's the same thing as I said you before. So now, this is important here, and you want to listen to this carefully. So if you look at these two equations, um, what we have is the uh, W tilde, which um, is U tilde and V tilde, because U tilde is X coordinate and V, v tilde is Y coordinate. Then we can take all those points which we have, the P points and F frames, we can um, take this equation and actually put them like this. As you see that what we are doing here, if I take the uh, first point and multiply with the I1, I will get the first point coordinates x. If I take the first point and multiply with j, I will get its y coordinates. So since I have p points and f frames so these are the p-points in 3D, and these are the basically the uh, rotation matrices for these different frames. If I multiply uh, this with that, I'm going to get this, and which is follows this equation, which is saying take the 3D point, project in the i, you get the x-coordinate, take the 3D point, project in j, you get y-coordinate. This is true for the, all the points, and this is this is actually basically saying that to um, using this thing for all the points like that. So we have one big column which is uh, this one and this has the um, the different x and y unit vectors as I showed you before in the figure for every frame and um, the second factor second matrix is the 3D coordinates. So these are the unit coordinates for every frame. This is the I and J for the first frame. We'll have I and J for second frame, third frame, and fourth frame, and so on. And this will tell you how the camera is oriented with respect to the word coordinate system, okay? And we just need to know two, I and J, because if you know I and J, we can find out K. How? How can you find out K? Cross product. So that's the idea. So that is really neat, okay? So that's what we are getting to. And it's a pretty simple manipulation, but the amazing thing is that, you know, it really works, and uh, that's why this paper is more than 2,000 citations. You know, it's a really good paper, especially for learning. I mean, this is, you know, a long time ago, but um, uh, for understanding and learning, this is a really good paper. There are many better methods now, but this is a really good, uh, good way. And this shows you, in order to solve the real problem in computer vision, you need to use some mathematics tool, which people have known for many, many years, but you just apply it, fit in there, and you can solve the problem. So therefore, it's important to know the basics in the math, otherwise you will have you know, a lot of problems. Okay, so, so this, uh, I think, uh, formulation um, of W tilde like this, that we have two components. One is the R matrix, which captures the rotation information of all these frames with respect to word coordinates, and which basically consists of I vector and J vector, and then the 3D points of these P points, 3D coordinates of P points. So that is essentially a structure for motion problem. So we don't know these. You know, we are given W tilde because you have KLT tracks. You have the points of each point in every frame. You have those tracks. You can compute this. 
as you compute at W, you can find the mean, subtract it, you can compute W tilde also. So given W tilde, we want to find out the R matrix and the S matrix. That is the problem. Because R is a rotation, which is the motion with respect to the word coordinate, and the S is the 3D coordinates of these points, and there are P points there. So that's, that's what we have. Okay? So now here is again the rank, rank idea, as we were talking about, that there are very key concepts which are very simple, uh, which are used again and again in this course. So rank is one of them. We talk about rank idea in the fundamental matrix. Okay, so here will be another use of rank constant. So now this is saying that um, the S is a matrix, it will have a rank, and R is a matrix, it will have rank also. Now S is a rank, um, rank of S is 3 because it consists of the 3D points of these P points, and uh, we need the three numbers. You know, it, it, you can have only three linearly independent coordinates, linearly independent vectors. So that's why it is uh, 3D points. It can be less than three if these points are in a one plane. Maybe you can have two. But we are assuming they are not planar, not coplanar. So therefore, any points in 3D you can describe with three numbers, x, y, z. So which means the rank of this matrix will be 3s. So that consequence of that is that if the rank of this is S, then the product of this rank of this will be also 3. It cannot be more than that. If you have two matrices multiplied together, it will be the rank of the you know, matrix which will have the minimum rank, okay, the minimum number. So that's one thing. So, so now they come up with uh, this theorem, which is very simple and intuitive and it's very powerful. Say, without noise, the registered measurement matrix, which is W tilde, is at most of rank 3, which I just showed you. It, it cannot be more than 3, okay, because it consists of S. So, um, so because W is the product of two matrices and maximum rank of S is 3, okay? So that's very good. So now, you know, just again a quick review as we talked about uh, rank uh, in the fundamental matrix. Rank is related to linearly independent idea. So we have, say, vectors v1 to vn. These are linearly dependent. If we can write down like them, and it's equal to 0, and um, if it's all scalars uh, a1 to an are not all 0, then they are linearly dependent. If not, then they are linearly independent. So we are going to in, be interested in how many linearly independent vectors are there in particular vector space. So in 3D, you know, there are three linearly independent vectors, you know, which can be 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. These are the x-axis, y-axis, z-axis. So now rank of matrix is the column rank of matrix is the maximum number of linearly independent column vectors, okay? Then row rank of matrix is maximum number of linearly independent vectors um, of that, you know, the rows. And then, um, like that, the column rank of A is the dimension of the column space of A, and the row rank of A is dimension of the row space of A. You know, we have, we have talked about that just for review here. So you can also find the rank of a matrix, as I told you, uh, like this, you can do row echelon form like you do in Gaussian elimination backward substitution. You take a matrix A and then try to make it upper triangular matrix so that on the diagonal below, the elements below the diagonals are zero and above the diagonal are non-zero and that will be row echelon form. And uh, the way to do it will be that you take, um, you know, try to uh, take the second row, multiply by two and add uh, I'm mean, going to take the first row, multiply by 2, and add to the second row, okay? So this 2, multiply by 2, you know, 2 minus 2 will be 0, and so we'll get 1, 2, 1, this will remain, but this will change. Now it will become 0, 1, 3 because of this operation. Then you can have another operation, take the first row, multiply by 3, and add to the third one, okay? So um, that will give you the first one not change, and second one change, but this is going to change and get you zero here. 
and of course the minus three, three, uh, mul you know, multiply the first row, and uh, you will get here. Now you already have zeros here. Then you want to get zero here. So then second one is that you are going to add these two rows, R two, R three. Because you add these two, this will become zero. This will become um, zero also. And the first row is this, second row is third. Now this is in row stand form because you have a diagonal. All the elements below the diagonals are zero, and therefore, the in this one we can have only two linearly independent vectors. Therefore, rank of this is two. So it's a just a try example to convince you that you can find a rank of any matrix like that. But there there are lots of quick way to do it in MATLAB. Okay. So so now we we have a good um, basis, good theory that while we are solving very important problem, given the KLT tracks, we want to find out their 3D location and we want to find out the rotation from one frame to other frame. We want to find out structure, which is the 3D points, and we want to find out the motion, which is the rotation. That's the problem. Okay. So now the most important um, part of this uh, most easy part of this will be how to find translation because the motion consists of both things translation and rotation so we already have equations to find that you know rotation uh, equation for rotation those those i j for every frame so translation we are going to talk about now and translation is actually very easy which will be just the mean of these points in every frame and that's amazing, and, and we'll show you how you can compute that. Okay, so we are going to start this mean normalized uh, x coordinates of the point P in frame F, which you have been seeing that, and um, we can rewrite this like this. So we'll take this on one side, we'll bring this other side. So UFP tilta plus AF. This is the mean, and this is the normalized coordinate x of point P in frame F. Okay, and we also know that this normalized um, coordinate x is given by taking the 3D point, projecting on the the unit vector i. Okay, which which we have been using. So um, now we are going to um, put instead of this one, this which is the the 3D point and unit vector, which is shown here, and this is the same thing. Okay, and uh, we um, also know from the C equation that the image x coordinate unnormalized are given by that. You take the 3D point, you know, subtract from translation, and then project on the i. This is what I showed you in the in the geometry. So now we have two kind of definition of UFP. One is this equation. Another one is this equation and we can compare okay so as you see this first term and first term is the same so which implies that af has to be equal to this so that's what we get af is equal to minus t f which is multiplied by the if okay so this is telling you your translation tf is a translation vector in the frame f so we are taking the translation vector, we are projecting the translation vector in the i, which is the x-axis, and that actually is obtained by the average of the x-coordinate of the point, which is, which is very interesting. No? So to find a translation, uh, just average the x-coordinates, you get translation. Average the y-coordinate, you get translation in y. So that's it. So that's the important thing that we can find very trivially the translation which is projected on the image plane by finding the average. Okay, so um, that's what we get. And um, then now we can look at this um, W uh, a little differently that we have these equations. We are saying the image coordinate x in the frame f of point P is given by take the 3D coordinate of point P project and the i uh, unit vector and add this translation af and similarly this is for the y coordinates okay so now we can take all these points 
point 0.1, point 0.2, point 0.3, and all these frames, we can write down this W matrix, so that's what we are talking about. And it turns out that we have the this form that we have this big matrix rotation, there was structure matrix, and we have a translation vector for all these frames, and this is just ones. So what we have is, as you remember, that we have a W matrix, we have P points, and we have F frames. For every point, we have two numbers, X coordinate and Y coordinate. First part of, of that W matrix was the X coordinate. So we have F rows, okay, and P columns. Then the second part of was the Y coordinate. So we have F rows and P columns. So therefore, the dimension of this W matrix is 2F by P, okay? And uh, then we have the R matrix, which contains of I, J for the, all these frames. And uh, we have, we have um, uh, for each one of these, we have um, three, um, three columns and then we have two F rows. And then we have, um, in this case, the structure. We have P points, and for each one of them, we have 3D coordinates. So it's a three by P. We have three rows, and we have P columns like that. These are the points. Okay, so then, um, so if you multiply two F by three, three by P, you get two F by P, so which is the same dimension. Then we are putting here the translation, uh, which is, essentially um, the translation X for frame 1 is given by A1 translation in X frame 2 is given by A2 and so on this is for the X translation for F frames and this is for the Y translation in the F frames and these are the ones so if you take um, this T vector which has the 2F numbers F for the X and another F for Y and this is the two F rows and one column. And you take uh, another, um, this vector here, which has one rows and P column, then you multiply this by that also, it will become two F by P. So this is two F by P, this is two F by P, and this whole thing is consistent. So it's capturing the image coordinates and the 3D word coordinates, the R matrix and the translation and all that in this nice, you know, one formula, okay? It's a pure linear algebra, there's nothing more. Okay, so now, you know, as we, as we said that projected camera translation can be computed just for the mean. Just find the mean of X coordinate and Y coordinate, this is translation X, translation Y, pure. That's no problem. Okay, so now we want to um, look at this, um, um, result which says that if there's no noise then W delta must be of rank at most 3. That's what I, I explained to you. Now when in this ideal condition that because in this equation. Now when the noise corrupts the image then we will have problem. It may be possible that W delta may not have rank 3. Okay? So so we want to extend this theorem, that main result, which is you know theoretically correct, but when you have measurements, you know you may have small error in x y coordinate of the scale d points. You know, um, then it will create a problem because it's looking for precisely right coordinates, and if your image resolution is not enough, you may have a problem. So um, what we are going to do there, there, first is that. Given that matrix W, we want to find out the rotation and we want to find out the shape, okay? So, um, and which means we have a one matrix, we want to factor in two matrices, okay? And whenever you have this case, you do what is called singular value decomposition. You can take a matrix and decompose into three matrices. And we have used this again in the fundamental matrix. So that's what we are going to do. So we'll take the W delta and decompose in these three matrices. And um, this is, as we've been talking about, this is 2F by P. And then this will become 2F by P. 
and this will become p by p this will have singular values and this will become p by p okay so now singular value um, decomposition is again a very intuitive idea very simple but very powerful used many different places so so the idea is that we can take a matrix a which is the m by n we can break it into these three matrices okay and um, this not necessarily you know square matrix but can be rectangle matrix m by n so therefore this will become um, m by n this will become n by n and this will become n by n in MATLAB you can just do SVD given a matrix will give you these three matrices okay which which is very good so of course this is a diagonal matrix it will have only elements on the diagonal and these are the singular values which are the square root of the eigenvalues and these vectors in this is orthogonals and which means you take the two um, of these vectors and find a dot product if they are not the same it will become zero if they are same, they become one. That's the property of these uh, these matrices. So now, um, if we have we don't have a noise, then it's very easy. We do the SVD, we find the rotation in the structure. But when we have the noise, then we have to come up with some way to deal with that. So what we are going to do when we take the W delta we just find a SVD we get these three matrices okay and uh, if there's no noise then you know we are done but if there's noise then we may have problem so what we are going to do we will take the O1 this matrix and break it in two matrices O1 prime and O1 double prime okay and the way we are going to do is we'll take the first three columns from O1 we'll call O1 prime the remaining columns, which will be p minus three, we'll call them O1 double prime. Okay? Because the first three, what we need, because the rank is three, and other one actually, you know, are not useful. So that's one thing we are going to do. And of course, this has two f rows. So um, that's one thing. And similarly, we are going to break the sigma matrix, this gamma, sigma, sigma, or gamma matrix, into two parts this sigma 1 and sigma 2 and like that okay this will have first three column and this will have remaining p minus three columns so because it's a diagonal matrix okay so like that then we will do the same thing for the O2 again break in two parts O2 prime and O2 double prime which will have the first three rows and the remaining p minus three rows so that is we are doing to deal with the noise because ideal condition we should have these singular values zero but due to noise they may not be zero the rank may not be three so we want to impose the rank that it has to be three okay so then we can express this w tilde in terms of the summation of these two the O1 prime and sigma prime and O2 prime plus O1 double prime and sigma double prime and O2 prime like that and this is the way we have composed these O1, O2 and so on okay it's a very simple thing to do so that's what we have now useful information is in the first part this is what we have okay so um, we are going to use that, we just ignore that. And that's it. Then this is the best rank 3 approximation of the W delta matrix, we'll call W hat. And that's what will tell us the rotation of all these frames and also the structure, the S matrix. And we are done. So saying the best possible shape and rotation estimates obtained by considering only three greatest singular values of W tilde together with corresponding left and right eigenvectors. That's what we did. Okay. So um, so now to find the rotation, we are going to take the O1 prime and under root of sigma 1 prime. This will give you a rotation. And the structure will take the under root of sigma. Um, 
um, prime and the O2 will give you a structure. When you multiply together, we'll get this. And that's it, you are done. So using the W matrix, which is your KLT points, you can do this and you get the motion, 3D motion, rotation in every frame, 3D translation in every frame, and 3D points of these, po uh, 3D lo location of these points in 3D, you know, which is pretty interesting and a very simple method. And, and, and that's, I, that's it. So it's a rotation matrix, and this is the shape matrix, and this is the... So one thing here is that this decomposition is not unique, and you can, you know, uh, do something on the top of it to make it unique, but we are not going to get, get into that. But, but we'll assume this all this is true, and we are done. Okay? So um, let me show you some results. And uh, so you will, you can actually try this uh, yourself since you have KLT, and it will be just one line program in MATLAB. So we have these are the frames, okay, and um, so and these are the points, you know, about the 403 feature points uh, which they have detected, and then for this sequence. They can estimate the rotation, the three rotations, very accurately. Now here, you know, if you look at carefully, um, there are two curves actually, and they are very similar, so very hard to see. One curve is a ground truth, other curve is computed, and they are really very, very close. So you cannot really distinguish them. If I zoom in first, maybe you will see the dotted curve. So the estimate of the rotation, one rotation with respect to different frames, another rotation and then third rotation compared to the ground truth very very close and this tells you the difference between the ground truth and um, the computed and this is you know 0 0.1 degrees or something you no know? it's a very very small difference for you know this this case so that's one thing and uh, then um if you look at here, so they can recover enough sequence, they can recover these are the 3D points they recovered. Um, and this shows you interesting fact that for this uh, house, um, they actually measure by in inches the dimension of these different sides of the house. Okay, so here we are showing the um, one number is actual ground truth and other number is algorithm give you so as you see they are very very close um, so here this was 76 and algorithm says 75.7 okay this was 84 but algorithm 84.1 this is 53 53 and all these numbers which is you know pretty impressive so you can actually recover this structure uh, using this method uh, and then once you have that then you can use these images to get um, um, 3D visualization of this house you know different viewpoint and all this and um, these are the KLT tracks which you will have and uh, <coughs> it's another example and this one I showed you earlier so you take these images and get the tracks and then you can synthesize these images like this. Um, so so that's that's it. Um, so these are images here. So um, th this is a very nice paper. Um, you can look at this was published in 92, um, which basically described this method. And also the book by Zaliski has a nice section on that.